Uh, my name is Asin Reza. I'm a real estate agent here in the GTA, and uh, I've been in the business for about uh, 12 years now. Um, pretty long time. And uh, I have on my panel my esteemed guests and mortgage experts, Mohammed Rashid and Fatima Riley, who I'm sure many of you know already. Um, but we're going to be talking about a few things and just going to go over the format real simply for you guys. So the first part, I will discuss, you know, the state of the market, what's happening, you know, some home buyer tips, home seller tips, um, investor tips as well. Uh, we're going to talk about maybe what's going to happen for 2024, 25, 26, some predictions based on my opinion. Uh, I'll then hand it off to Mohammed and Fatma, who talk about the interest rates, um, how that's impacting the real estate market. Uh, after that, we're going to be talking about some investment opportunities uh, for the younger guy, especially, you know, to get into the mindset of how to be an investor, how to overcome those limiting beliefs. And then Fatima and uh, Mohammed will uh, finish it off with uh, qualifications, you know, how to qualify and how to achieve uh, that dream of being an investor. So if it's okay with you, we'll get started. So on your sheets, there's a couple of papers, as you can see. We're gonna get the boring stuff out in the front, in the uh, <laughs> beginning, so it's all numbers, but you know, hopefully you guys will appreciate that. A boots on the ground update. So as you all know, it's no secret, uh, the market is pretty stagnant right now. The main reason being the interest rates, right? Interest rates were high. Uh, we've seen a couple of cuts, but really that hasn't made much of a difference, to be honest. Um, last year was probably our slowest year in the last two decades. We had about 65,000 sales in total. So it was a rough year for real estate. This year, we're probably gonna hit about 70, maybe 75,000 sales overall. So, you know, that's a slow market in general. Now, for anyone looking to buy a house in this market, you know, what I would suggest is that there's a lot of room to negotiate in this market. So to give you an example, um, I had a couple of clients who I helped out recently in the last two months. Um, one of my clients, we bought a condo in Mississauga and we were looking at two properties in the same building. One went for 600,000. And then we saw a unit below that, the exact same uh, specs, uh, same style. And the sellers wanted to get the same price because you know, our neighbors got 600000 We should get the same thing. We went in at five fifty, hoping that they would you know, budge. They didn't, obviously. But ultimately, we found out that they were pretty desperate to sell. And we got a price of five seventy. So there is a lot of negotiation room in this market if you are a buyer. And we haven't seen this market, I would say, in over it five or six years. So I've been in the business for about 12 years now. The last down market I saw was in 2017. This is the second down market that I have seen, right? Another example, I had a client of mine in New Market, and we got the house 70,000 below asking, right? So there's quite a bit of opportunities out there, I would say, if you are a buyer, you want to negotiate, you want to go in with a, maybe even a lowball offer, you can do a proper inspection, do your financing condition and not rush because there's not much competition out there. And with the rates being higher, even now, uh, there are still some opportunities as well. Now, if you're a seller, you know, what do you do, right? Because the buyers, it's great, but as a seller, what do you do? If you're in the market to sell your home, it is tough. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, it is gonna be a bit more difficult, but I always tell my clients that, you know, no matter what market you're in, if you price your home right, it'll still sell within 30 to 45 days. What I think people are struggling with right now, especially sellers, is that they want the 2021, 2022 prices, and they're listing it for that much, and they're not gonna get that, right? So the prices have dropped 10, 20% overall. Um, I'll give you my own example, right? So my wife and I, we sold our house uh, about two months ago uh, in Markham, and um, <coughs> our neighbor's house sold for 1.25 about six months ago, and uh, we got, 1.2 and I'm sharing personal examples because I want to give you guys some motivation um, some inspiration also to kind of you know keep it more casual so ultimately you know what are we going to expect 1.25 right our neighbors sold for 1.25 we're going to want 1.25 as well and as sellers you always think your house is the best on the market so <laughs> well, yeah, our house is better obviously right and ultimately what happened was we had 20 showings um, we ended up getting one offer for 1.1 million and um we were conflicted, like, what do we do? So we went back, negotiated, ultimately they came back at 1.2 million. Now the problem was, my wife wanted 1.25, I wanted 1.25, and we're like, what do we do, right? And then, I'll give you a secret, this is the one thing we did, there's no, no formula, no real straight tricks, we went to our moms, <laughs> and asked our, <laughs> asked our mothers, you know, what do we do, right? What's the secret, like, whatever you guys say, we'll do. So I asked my mom, she asked her mom, and, Without even hesitation, they were like, accept it. 
go for it. And my mom said the same thing, like no hesitation. My father was more analytical, so he was like, wait, you know, let's see if we can get more. <laughs> our trick, our issue was that if we went back with the 1.25, you know, maybe they would have walked away, right? So we accepted 1.2, and what ended up happening is three days later, three homes on the market came on that same street, and to this day, they're still on the market, right? Mm -hmm. Now, on the flip side, we bought a house which was 100K below the value. So it did work out ultimately, right? So that's kind of where... I think sellers have to be more realistic. In terms of what's gonna happen in 2024, the rest of the year, I think we're gonna have probably about 35,000 sales overall, which is slow. If we have more rate cuts, maybe that will pick up a little bit. I think 2025 will still be a slow market, will be more of a buyer's market. I think 2026 is where things are gonna pick up a little bit. But the next five, 10 years, and I could be wrong, this is my opinion, You know, I feel that we're gonna have a very steady market. So appreciation will be three to 5%. Not the 10, not the 15% we saw, you know, years before. Competition will be there, but not as much as was before. So a healthy 3 to 5% will be more realistic. And I think that's better for all people because we don't want a market that's going to be out of control. Mm -hmm. If that happens, government comes in, intervention, and then you have issues, you know. Um, and we had COVID happen as well, so that slowed the market down. But the rates went down as well, which picked the market up tremendously. And now we're seeing that rate uh, cut happen again. So that's the number side of things. I'm going to hand it off to Mohammed and uh, Fatima to talk about the interest rates. Then uh, we'll come back to me as well. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, first nugget I took away from that is always ask your mom in, uh, <laughs> in any of these decisions. And so they're taking the note down for that. Um, yeah, I, I think it'd be worthwhile to give you some context on what's happened in the rate environment over the last little while. And um, it's the number one question we always get uh, whenever we're, we're qualifying someone for a mortgage or we're uh, processing their mortgage application, which is, you know, do I go fixed or variable? Are rates going to go up or down? And, and how do we anticipate that? And I think the fact of the matter is us, nor the bank, you know, the Bank of Canada, the government, none of these economists have a crystal ball to know what's going to happen. I think if you look at the run up back in it's like 2020, 2020, 2022, when this started, uh, the rate acceleration started, um, everybody predicted, you know, it caps out at a certain point and we saw nine, 10 consecutive run-ups on, on rates. And so um, all that tells us is that it's, it's a very, very difficult environment to predict. And so um, I think the, the best place to start is, yeah, looking at this historically, um, in March 2022, the overnight lending rate, which is everybody hears the Bank of Canada's rates are going up or down. They use something called an overnight um, lending rate as their target to determine what the bank's prime rates, the, the CIBCs, the TDs of the world, what their prime rates are. And so that, that rate for the Bank of Canada was 0.25% in March 2022. And you saw a, an, a very, very aggressive run up to try and curb inflation um, up until towards the end of 2023, early 2024, uh, where it hit 5% as the overnight lending rate. And so from going from 0.25% to 5% is a very substantial increase. And um, where people felt it the most is, you know, if you've got a fixed rate, and we'll, we'll touch on this in a second, um, you're sort of locked in, you've got a predictable payment, you know what's going to come out every month. For the folks that own their own properties, their, their own occupied properties, or they had rental properties and they opted for a variable rate, because at that time when variable rates 1%, it's like, why would I not, why would I pass that up? Um, those people saw their payments shoot up significantly to the point where they were either significantly cash flow negative, they couldn't sustain the properties, they had to sell in an accelerating rate environment that meant that they had to lose money in the property based on what, uh, you know, relative to what its maximum value was. And so um, the, the best way to sum it up is like an incredibly volatile, turbulent, very difficult time leading up to where we are right now. Um, I think it's, it's very important to understand before I touch on like where things are going, um, this, this whole concept of fixed versus variable. And so, you know, we have a habit, we're on Instagram, just like I saw in Pumping Out Content, and the, the one thing everybody waits for is like, what's the Bank of Canada's announcement? And the minute they see a, a, you know, a quarter percent decrease, the questions start flooding in is like, does, have the mortgage rates dropped? Is my fixed rate going to go lower? Do my payments drop, et cetera? And those are all entirely valid questions, but it's important to understand the difference between how fixed rates and variable rates function in the market. And so when the Bank of Canada makes a change, an announcement on whether they're increasing or decreasing their rates, that primarily affects variable rates. And so whenever, if anybody here has ever opted for a mortgage or is learning about rates, oftentimes the variable rate mortgages are the prime rate of that bank. And so as of today, prime rates for most of the banks are 6.7%, less a discount relative to that rate. And so it'll be 6.7 minus you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, whatever that bank is offering you. And so as the Bank of Canada's rate goes up and down, and so does the, the, you know, the TDs and the CIBCs of the world. So do your payments and so does your 
um, your, your mortgage, uh, sorry, your mortgage payments. Um, so the Bank of Canada's overnight lending rate is the primary driving factor for whether your payments go up or down on a variable rate mortgage. On the fixed rate side, those are driven by something called the bond yields in Canada. And so um, there are Canadian bonds that pay out a certain percentage on if you acquire these bonds, and those fluctuate based on different factors, economic factors, inflation, et cetera. Um, but the, the two of them run on separate influencers. And so while the Bank of Canada's rate may go down and it adjusts a variable rate, you won't necessarily see that impact to fixed rates right away. And so that's the number one question we get when somebody's going through qualification or an application is, why am I not seeing the fixed rate go down when the Bank of Canada's announcement just changed? It's very important to understand those, those indicators. Um, and so the, the bond yields, when we look at fixed rates specifically, uh, are very temperamental. And so as you hear news coming out of you know, the wars in the world, or you hear gas prices going up, or inflation's volatile, those things have influencing factors to the bond yields. And so oftentimes, you know, we may have a five, you know, three year fixed rate of 4.84 today, but that may go up to 4.99 uh, next week. Even though the Bank of Canada's rate hasn't changed, fixed rates are, are volatile as well. So it's very important to understand the, the underlying uh, drivers for that. Now, what's the path forward look like for the rest of the year? And I think we're in this environment where, where everybody can sort of come to the conclusion that rates are on the decline. Um, we saw the first cut happen after a year and a half it, in June of this year, uh, quarter point reduction. We saw another one in July of this year, and so we're, we're, we're half a percentage down. Um, the most interesting thing, I think, looking at it from our perspective is the Bank of Canada has been intentional with their rate cuts. The idea is that as you, you sort of make these rate cuts, they want to be very careful about them to not reignite the markets again, to drive inflation back up and to you know, spiral out of control again. What I think has been most interesting for us, and you've probably seen this yourself, is these rate cuts that happen, like activity is still flatline. It's still dead. Um, and even after the second consecutive rate cut, um, nothing's changed. And so uh, we see this firsthand in a lot of examples. You know, as I talked about his personal experience of selling his own home, we see this on a lot of like condo properties that are being purchased right now and the appraisals are coming, you know, $100,000, $150,000 short. And these are in prime areas, Young and Eglinton, downtown. These are areas where you expect the value to be returned for the properties that you're buying. But we're sitting here three years later after these pre-construction projects are complete and still seeing the values below what they expect it to be. So um, where do we go from here? I think that, you know, rate cuts are still being factored. In. Um, if we can trust the economics, you know, economists' predictions, and it's been tough to follow for the last little while, um, we're, we're expecting another one to two rate cuts to happen this year. Uh, it's very important to look to the U.S. Uh, as an indicator, a leading indicator of what's going to happen in Canada. A lot of our trade, a lot of our currency is dependent on, on the U.S. markets. And so we look to them as a signal for what's going to happen. And right now, they've sort of guaranteed that there's going to be another two cuts uh, expected to happen before the end of the year. Um, and if we follow suit with that, that puts our Bank of Canada's overnight lending rate down to 4%. And we should see our our prime rate dropped to about, you know, six, just over 6%. Um, and then you'll see relative discounts. So that means uh, you'll see variable rates probably near the 5% range. Right now we're at five and three quarters uh, for variable rates on the, on the, the most competitive side. Um, but rate cuts are expected. And it's this balancing act of us making sure that we don't repeat the cycle again. Um, if we see another two rate cuts, I don't know what the tipping point is at which real estate starts to flare up again. Um, I don't know that we'll necessarily get to the bidding wars that we've seen or that's like really competitive nature. Like if you look, if you look at the sheet, I was just looking at this when we were, uh, as I was talking about like 2021, like 121,000 sales. And I remember every, every deal was a bidding war and everything was going over a hundred thousand dollars asking. Um, and that was the time to live in. Uh, and now you sort of see this, this sort of contrasting, uh, economic view, which has been really interesting. I think the last thing I'll say on interest rates before we, we sort of switch over to different gears is, now another question we often get is like, when is the right time to buy? And um, interest rates and home prices are things that I, in my personal opinion, find like relative, right? Like you may have had a, a I'm just gonna use an example. Let's say a house in Richmond Hill. You know, you may have had a 1% interest rate in 2021 um, that was tied to buying a property for like 1.5 million. Um, and you look at today's market, you may have a 4% interest rate, but you're now buying that property at about a million or a million, 1.1 million. And so um, there's a scale here at which it, it sort of tips and uh, depending on how interest rates go up or down, how uh, market values go up or down. I think the, the general trend is you'll see appreciation over time. 
Um, and that'll be like one of the next things we talk about is like, think back to yourselves, like what your objectives are when you're buying a home, when you're buying a rental property. Is this a, is this, I'm going to live in it for a year and quick flip and, um, you know, try to make some profit off of this. That is a big factor in your decision when deciding an interest rate. Or do I see myself living in this property or holding on to this rental property for the next 10, 12 years? Those, that objective that you have at the back of your mind is a big influencing factor in what uh, decision you take when deciding on a fixed or variable or the type of rate that you opt for or how you qualify for the mortgage. So long spiel, but hopefully that gives you a general sense of how the market's operating. Nice. Awesome. No, thank you for that. Um, and that's a good segue because uh, before I touch up on this next topic, um, just want to talk about just quickly about, you know, sellers, buyers, investors, and to really give you like an objective point of view, because I know you guys here, realtors, always saying that this is a great time to buy when it's a bad market, it's a good market. And that's typically what we are, you know, accustomed to. Um, you know, what I like about these guys, they're very objective, and I hope to be as objective as I can as well. So for anyone who's looking to just buy a house, if you're a first time home buyer, I do believe this is a good opportunity to buy a home because prices have come down 10, 20%. But I also think that you need to negotiate and you need to be careful about your affordability, right? So even if you get approved for a certain amount, you have to ask yourself like, can I afford this house, right? If you can't afford it, don't push yourself to limit because you're not buying to, to show off to people, right? You're buying to have a home for your family. And if it's a smaller home, it's fine. It's not a big deal. Um, your health is important, your, your lifestyle is important, uh, your affordability is important, your family is important, and it's not worth putting them at risk for buying something that you know you can afford, right? So that's number one. Um, if you're a seller and just selling your house, to be honest with you, it's not a good time to sell, right? I mean, we make our money, I make my money off of selling your homes, you know? But mm -hmm. if I can be honest with you, it's not a good time to sell because prices have dropped 10, 20%. Now, if, if you're in a situation where you can't make up your mortgage payments and you're desperate to sell and you want to cut your losses, that's a different thing. That's where I would advise you, you know what, you're losing money, let's put it up in the market and let's sell. But that's a decision you have to answer yourself as well. But if you're looking to sell and you don't need to sell, then why would you sell, right? Hold on to it because the values will go up over time. As an investor, which I'm going to talk about now, um, investing is tricky because in this market, I believe you can still find opportunities and deals, but you have to be very, very selective as to where you can buy, what you can buy. So it's not like, you know, five years ago where you can just kind of close your eyes and, and pick a condo and say, this pre-construction, this pre-construction, and I'm getting a good return out of it. That's not going to happen anymore, and that's probably not going to happen for the next five, ten years, because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we're not going to see rates come back to 1%. No. No, right? That's that's gone. That's gone. Yeah, that was right? like a black swan event that only happened during COVID. Exactly. I don't think it's happening anytime Exactly, soon. right? So so those days are gone. But what I've learned from my process and, and what these guys have learned is there are opportunities. So again, to give you my own example, and, and this is not to impress you, but more to impress upon you and to give the younger guys, <laughs> my brother, I'm looking at you, <laughs> and the buzzer, to give you some inspiration is that you need to be more creative and think outside the box to invest. So if Toronto is too expensive, forget about Toronto. You know, look at places like Kingston, Windsor, you know, even in the States, right? There are so many opportunities. Like me, myself invested in Kingston with a couple of my partners as well. Um, we did a joint venture. We bought it for 400000 It's now gone up to 600000 and it rents for about $2,600 a month. That same property in Toronto, is probably worth a million. I would rent for only maybe a couple hundred bucks more. Mm -hmm. So that yield, that spread is not that much. And Kingston market, if you look at it, appreciation has been 5% year over year. So that's where we got creative, right? Things that we look for in the investment market before we invest, like again, to be selective is, you know, public transit, you know, close to highways, um, you know, school district, you know, is a walking distance to the school, uh, employment, you know, like so we reinvested, uh, there was a brand new Amazon warehouse that they built here, right? So there was a brand new one there. So a lot of the applications we were getting were from people that were working there. Good renters, you know, uh, make good income. Um, so that's a good indicator. Um, you know, is it close to university? So Queen's University is there. You know, had a lot of professors, uh, medical uh, people that were in the, in the uh, MBA programs there reach out to us. Like the clientele was just like amazing, amazing over there, right? We look for that. 
and we look for population growth, you know, we look at that stuff. So those are indicators that, you know, if Toronto is priced out for you, it's okay, look outside of Toronto, Kingston is there, Barrie is there, and I know one objective we always get is, you know, well, it's too far, how am I gonna manage it? Yeah. Everything is remote now, right? You don't have to go to the property every time a toilet breaks down. You can make a phone call to your plumber and say, you know what, can you go in the property and fix the toilet? Yeah, you should make a visit once or twice a year, but it's worth the cost, right, to see how your property is doing. But you don't have to be there for every issue that happens or every dilemma that happens. So, you know, we've been grateful that we've seen that sort of, you know, future outlook now. But I need you guys to start thinking like that as well, is that get your mind out of the fact that, you know, I can only buy in GTA and that's it. And that's, you know, uh, do or die. Like it's, gonna, it's, it's not do or die. It's like... I can look at other opportunities and honestly, even if you can't afford GTA and you can rent over here and buy somewhere else, invest, that's a good idea too. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my clients, a lot of my real, uh, realtor friends actually rent their homes, but they invest in London, they invest in Kingston, right? So that's the kind of mindset that you guys got to get into. Second thing is, and maybe this will be a little bit longer, but I just want to hit this home because we have some younger guys here, is, you know, write down a plan in writing, physically in writing, and a deadline that you want to buy a house by this and this time. So my example, you know, I was selling real estate for about six years and believe it or not, I, had, I didn't have my own house. I was with my parents, right? For six years as a realtor, you know, I don't have my own house, but I'm helping others buy and sell their homes, right? So for me, it was like, you know, it was like, it's conflict. I'm like, what am I doing? But it was okay. Um, I wrote down a plan. I said, in five years, I'm going to buy a property and I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to come with a down payment. It took me six years, but I wrote it down. And you think of ways to increase your income and decrease your expense in those five years. So automatically, I'm like, you know what? How can I increase my income? In that span of five years, you know, I built up a small property management company. So I have about 10 properties under my management, 100 bucks each, not a lot, but gave me a thousand bucks a month, you know, which goes toward my savings. Um, you know, any government benefits, child benefits, you know, we use that for saving and stuff. Um, so whatever was coming in my hand, I was sort of just, you know, saving it, saving it, saving it. And then you think of ways. So for you guys, you know, even if it's, you know, Uber side, you know, side hustle, uh, whether it's, um, um, an Amazon online shop, I don't know, whatever you can do, you can do that. You can make a thousand, two thousand a month and then, you know, save that up for, to expedite the process. Expenses, decrease your expenses is a big thing. You know, we spend a lot of money on stuff we shouldn't be spending on. Me, me especially, even now to this day, and my dad knows this, like we eat out a lot. <laughs> so, and uh, we try to cut back, but you know, we just, the crown pizza is right here. Like, you know, it's like after the, the session, we might just go there, right? So, but things like that, I mean, reward yourself, but you know, not every day, of course, but you got to think about that stuff. So save your expenses. Once you have it in writing, you'll automatically start to process it and you'll start to figure ways to increase your income and decrease your expenses. Um, start saving. Even if it's 50 bucks a month, start saving. I know it's a small amount. My dad always taught me from a young age that if you can't save 50 bucks, you're not gonna save 500 bucks. So if you start 50 bucks now, you'll see that go to 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 a month. That will help you expedite the purchasing process, right? Third, I think this is the most important point that this is not a race. Um, you see your family, friends, cousins buying a house. Never compare yourself to anybody because that's probably the biggest dream killer that I've seen. And I used to do it a lot. So I stopped doing that. I said, I'm going to buy when I can afford to buy. Same thing with you guys, right? Buy when you're ready. It's not a race, you know, even if you're priced out of Toronto. Like I said, Kingston, Windsor, there's so many opportunities that you can actually buy in. It's never ever too late. And I was talking to a car uncle this, this uh, morning when he came, you know, we're saying it's, he was saying it's never too late. There's always opportunities, right? So if it takes you 10 years, let it take you 10 years, it's fine, but it's never going to be too late to find an opportunity. Next thing, uh, leverage your parents. <laughs> so <laughs> if you have parents uh, that have their house paid off and uh, you need a down payment, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask them. You know, they, they can, they'll say no maybe, but they might say, you'd be surprised, they might say yes. They probably will say yes, right? Leverage your parents. Um, maybe move, at, move back in with your parents, live in the basement, save the rent, save the money, and whatever money you're making off of your income, save it and use that towards your down payment, right? So leverage your parents, because a lot of our parents have homes that are paid off. Don't be afraid to ask them. So hopefully parents don't get mad, but <laughs> that's just a piece of advice <laughs> for the young guys. Purchase a home that allows you to rent a portion of your property, right? 
So again, my example, you know, we, we bought a house recently and uh, we rented out our basement for 1500 bucks a month. Like it's a lifesaver. It goes such a long, it's, it pays off one third of my mortgage, which is amazing, right? And I know it's somebody living in your basement or whatever, privacy issues, but you know, uh, forget about that right now. Right now the economy costs are going up. It's expensive to, to live in Toronto. Think of ways where you can you know, reduce those costs and renting out a basement, renting out a room, whatever it is, consider the option because that will go a long, long way, right? You know, I always say building wealth in real estate is one thing, but what you do with that wealth is, is more important. So yes, I know we all wanna make money and get rich, but is that really the purpose, right? I think the real purpose of that is to use that wealth to help your family, help your friends, give charity, right? And have a good lifestyle, but you don't have to splurge, but you now have enough money where you can look out for others as well and be a resource. That's, that's the ultimate goal. So we're not here to you know, tell you, okay, you, know, you gotta make money, you gotta hustle. No, that's not the point. The point is make the money, enjoy your life, but give to others as well so that others can also enjoy. And charity, at the end of the day, that's what we're here for, I believe. But that's what I think um, is the ultimate purpose, ultimate goal. Um, just a couple more points about investment options, because I really want to hit this home about what is out there when you think of investing. You know, after you write down your plan, your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, now what can I invest into? Four things. Number one is going to be a cash-flowing property. A cash-flowing property is something that you will buy where your rent will cover your expenses, but also give you income. So again, my own example, not to impress you, but to inspire you, impress upon you, is that we, my wife and I have a property in Timmins. We bought it two years ago. Um, you want, guys want to guess what the price was? Just take a, take a guess. <laughs> How much? Three, oh, close, 110, 110,000, right, in Timmins. So we get about a thousand bucks a month for that property after mortgage expenses. We cash flow about 500. 500 is a lot, right? It pays the gas, pays you know, the kids' school. Like it goes a long, long way, right? So what I what I mean by saying is that if you're priced out of Toronto, you can go to North Bay, you can go to Timmins, you can go to these places and buy a property for 110,000, 200,000, a down payment of maybe 30, 40, 50,000, right? And start making cash flow, right? And when that property appreciates over time, now you can sell that or refinance it, which we'll talk about later, and use that funds to buy your primary residence in Toronto, right? Uh, so my example, again, you know, we bought a property, um, a condo in Markham, a one bedroom plus 10, and um, we bought it pre-construction. Uh, the value grew by 100,000. We then used that 100,000, less the expenses, and ultimately we're able to move into our townhome. Right? Now we sold the town, which appreciated more, moved into a detached home, right? Close to our parents' house, which is walking distance, and that was our sort of motivation, right? So you gotta step by step, right? The next um, investment opportunity is, you know, properties that appreciate. So these properties may be negative cash flow, right? This is where you have to be very selective as to what you buy, because you don't wanna be paying thousand, two hundred bucks out of your pocket. But Downtown condos in Toronto are really, really struggling right now. We're, we're almost like six months of inventory where you can go in there and pick up an amazing deal, right? And this is like the heart of downtown um, where you can actually buy a condo which will rent out for $2,500, $3,000 a month, right? So it's an opportunity to, to get into the condo market in downtown. You know, you look for big cities with the indicators I mentioned earlier, uh, but the highway, the transit, universities, you know, Kingston, these areas where you don't have to be afraid to invest outside of Toronto if you can't afford to invest in Toronto. The third point, uh, pre-construction properties, right? So I've done pre-construction. I know many of you have done it as well. Pre-construction is good because you don't, if you can't get a mortgage today, it, you can get it four years, five years when the property closes, but it gets you the ability to enter the market. So you can only pay 5% down now or 10% and you just wait. You wait till three years, four years. And uh, at that point, when your income goes up, when you have the funds, you can, uh, then get the mortgage, and maybe by that time the value goes up, and if it doesn't, you can rent it out. So pre-construction is a good way for a lot of people to get into the market. Again, with pre-construction, you've got to be careful, right? You've got to look at, like Mohammed said, you've got to be careful because you want to be selective, make sure you buy in a good neighborhood that is a good deal, right? Not overpriced, a good deal, and that's where you can really make or build wealth. Uh, the last uh, point here, uh, multifamily investments, right? So if you don't like being a landlord, if you don't want to, you know, have the hassle of, you know, 
fixing toilets or you know f facilitating all this stuff, uh, you can go to a uh, multifamily investment firm. And we have a, a great resource here in the crowd, uh, Septain Panju, who you can speak to later on. He runs uh, Pragma uh, Properties, right? And, and the returns are really good, really, really good, right? So that's an opportunity. So what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't have to be physical real estate. It can be any asset class. It could even be like stocks, whatever, but use your money to make money, right? You put it in the bank, you're probably gonna lose money actually because it won't keep up with the inflation, right? So that was a bit long, but I hope that resonated. But I'll hand it off to uh, these guys to talk about uh, the next uh, uh, topic. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll unpack a lot of what he mentioned from, from our perspective. And I think there, um, it's important to give like real life examples that'll help resonate with a lot of you in this room. And so I was that version uh, that Esan described where, you know, this, this is before I got married, but I was like, I need like a fast car and I want like cool stuff. And that's where a lot of my money was going. Like I, I, was, I was the type of person where I get paid and like 90% of that income is discretionary and it was going towards the wrong things. And uh, I got married and it was grounding and uh, you need a home and you need a bunch of different things. And when you have kids, the um, even for us, like, like that objective change why we're doing the things that we're doing. And so now my life is not about cars or, or, or cool things. It's now about like building my kids' future. What, what will they inherit in the, in, in, um, in the future as well? And so, um, so, so putting a plan together and coming at it from that frame, that, that frame of mind or that mindset will definitely get you on the right track. I think um, when we talk about investment properties, just like uh, personal experiences. So uh, full disclosure, we've worked with us on uh, my personal fear was like, uh, I need, we were thinking about buying a rental property. Um, and like, it had to be in the GTA because I had to be able to visit the property. I had to be able to, you know, check in on it. I never even thought about what property management might look like, et cetera. Um, and it was, it was a sign to open up our eyes to like, look outside your region and we can figure out the logistics of how some of that stuff happens. So we ended up buying a property in Kingston. Um, and we also own a property in Etobicoke, uh, that we had done ourselves before we had talked to Hassan. Now there's a stark contrast between those two properties. One of them is older. One of them is, is something that we took upon ourselves. Uh, it's been like, it's not now property manages it and it's a nightmare. <laughs> he'll, he'll tell you like horror stories about that kind of stuff. Um, but when we sought out the guidance of Esan and we, we found this property in Kingston, things like that population growth, like what's around those areas, that type of stuff matters a lot. I think the, the first three applicants we got in this Kingston property that we bought were doctors, excellent credit, excellent income history, like triple A tenants that you, you wouldn't expect. But the reason being is we're close proximity to the, the Queens hospital. Or close proximity to a lot of things that would, would attract those types of clientele. Um, I think the other, the other way to look at that uh, when you think about investment properties is like um, everybody focuses on that cash flow number. And so uh, we bought this property in 2022, late 2022 Three. or 2023, it's a blur now. <laughs> um, but we bought this when interest rates were like five and a half percent. So not the best time to buy, but that's why not being aggressive and like being very patient to find that right opportunity is really important. Um, we're actually cash flow positive on this property in a rate environment that's five and a half percent. We've seen like fifty to one hundred thousand dollars in appreciation in about a year, and so that might be the edge case. But I think that the 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 idea that you want to be slow and steady, you don't want to just buy a property for the sake of buying a property. You should feel comfortable looking outside of your comfort zone, um, and that was the, the the deciding factor was. When you work with a realtor, uh, anybody, whoever it might be for that matter, in regions in which they've already operated or that they've already transacted in, you're able to leverage their network to give you confidence. I think having a team behind you when you make a transaction, whether it's a property for yourself, whether it's an investment property, you need folks like a lawyer, a realtor, an accountant in your corner to make sure that you're thinking about this holistically and what that path looks like forward. And so the idea that we had not only Isan but this whole team behind us making this decision is an important factor in why we decided to pursue uh, Kingston. So again, knock on wood, that property has worked out for us, but it's now opened up our eyes that we don't need to stay in Richmond Hill or in Vaughan. We can look to the outskirts. We have resources to manage these properties and it's worked out in our favor. And I think those, those are things to look for. Um, how do you come up with the funds to be able to buy these properties? These are, uh, I think about, uh, you know, Esan had the right idea. You, you, uh, you look to bank and mom and dad, uh, to see if they have funds available to help you with these purchases. Um, oftentimes people are renting and buying their first properties as rentals or uh, as, as appreciating properties that they can leverage for their own purchases in the future. Um, there are 
weighted decisions for us to think about you know can you borrow funds for the person uh for the purposes of buying a home could you advance a heloc there, there's like underlying qualification pieces that you need to factor in so if you borrow funds for a down payment to then purchase a property we need to factor in the servicing costs of that those borrowed funds um, could you look at your RSPs if this is your first property? There's a bunch of these first-time home buyer programs that you may or may not be aware of that you could leverage capital to be able to buy those properties. Um, Esan talked about being creative with the, the, the properties themselves. If there is a self-contained unit, if there is a walkout basement, and we can classify that property as a rental, what a lot of people don't know is they think that they, you need a tenant in that property when you're buying it to be able to uh, leverage the rental income. A lot of the banks will use something called market rent which says, if you were to rent this out after you moved in, what would the expected rent of that basement unit be? And so if we expect to pull in $1,500 or $2,000 a month, they will allow you to use that expected income, even before you earn it, as part of your qualification. And all of a sudden, I've now added $24,000 a year in extra income that I didn't have before when I'm qualifying for a property. And that could be the make or break between I'm buying a $500,000 property or I'm buying a $600,000 property. Um, and that's a, that's a really good... Uh, general rule of thumb that we often share with a lot of people when we first qualify them. We, we do these um, introduction calls uh, to, to help people qualify before we collect any documentation or we do anything uh, more accurate. But we run these like back of the napkin math scenarios. And the general rule of thumbs that you want to keep in mind is, let's say your household income is $100,000 between you know just you or you and your, your spouse or whatever it might be. Um, if you're putting less than 20% down, you want to multiply that number by about four, four and a half in this, in this rate environment. If you're putting 20% or more down, you want to multiply that by about five, five and a half. And that gives you the expected mortgage amount that you'd qualify for. Now that assumes like, you know, no debt, no car loans, et cetera. Um, when you are factoring in debt, you want to look at things like uh, credit cards, line of credits, car loans. And it's important to note, you know, every $500 a month in debt obligations will reduce your qualification by about 75,000. And so when you're leasing a car, when you're buying that $1,000 a month BMW, um, do it after you buy the house, not before. Um, those are very, very impactful numbers uh, on qualification. And oftentimes it serves as a shock to people. They've got excellent credit. They can maintain the payments, but in the bank's eyes, those types of debt obligations are, are very impactful. Um, oftentimes when we look at qualification as well, you know, you may have a line of credit balance, you may have a credit card balance, um, those are treated very aggressively by the banks as well. And so when we run qualification scenarios, we often want to look at um, maybe we just pay off that $5,000 credit card and reduce your down payment because that'll have a greater impact on increasing your qualification than it would be if you kept that credit card debt and, and had a higher down payment. So it's a lot of shuffling that goes around being able to decide how we, we proceed with those things. But uh, just to keep in mind that general rule of thumb of you know multiplying your household income by about four to five, five and a half times, depending on your down payment is a good sort of uh, back of the napkin way of understanding what you'd qualify for. I just wanted to say, you know, um, have a plan, even if you're not thinking of buying your house now, right? Speak to people like us, right? And we can help you build that plan, right? Just picking up the phone, having a conversation. It may not be in the horizon now, but maybe in the next three years it might be, right? And we can be there to guide you, to introduce you to the right people in order, you know, to help you fulfill that dream of buying a house. Yeah, I think oftentimes yeah. people are, um, and I don't know if this happens on the real estate side, people think our services cost something. Yeah. yeah. Um, we actually don't charge dime. We, we only get paid if we ever place your mortgage with a lender. And so... Oftentimes we're playing the long game. You know, you may come back to us in five years and in, in interest in a mortgage, but our the whole reason why we got into this business was to help people. Um, the background story is, you know, for you know my parents, obviously immigrants to Canada, they bought their first home, God, in like 2000 something, um, and they worked with a a, a, um, a bank representative. And for lack of a better word, they got screwed over with the rate and the qualification and left out at the last minute. And my parents bought a property that uh, was much more expensive than they originally thought it was going to be on the mortgage side. Um, that's what got me into pursuing mortgages. You know, how do I educate myself better so that not only my parents, but my family, that was my original objective was my family doesn't fall into this trap again. And it's $300, three months and you're licensed to be a mortgage agent in Canada, which is, which is a good thing, but also scary at the same time. Um, and so, you know, we sit here about a decade later now as qualified mortgage agents, um, that the, the whole objective behind why we got into this space was to help people to make sure they make informed decisions. And so oftentimes, you know, a prime example of that is in this rate environment, a lot of people come to us for renewals. Um, they've got an offer from their bank. 
you know, they, they want to try and get something more competitive. In like, I want to say like 80, 70 to 80% of those situations, that bank that you're with right now is, is going to have the best offer. And it doesn't cost you anything to, to, to stay with that bank. They don't requalify you. You don't go through the paperwork, et cetera. In those instances, we actually support those people who are coming up with renewals by giving them a rate offer that they can go back to their bank and negotiate something even lower, which means we don't get the business. But at the end of the day, they get a much more competitive rate from their existing bank that costs them nothing to sign a renewal. And so that's the primary objective of why we got into this business in the first place. And I think that's really important even when you're working with someone as you're figuring out this plan that you're jotting down or trying to determine what your goals or objectives are, um, is have the right people in your corner. Have the people who have your best interests in mind and who you feel like you have a genuine connection to or have your genuine best interests. Um, but it's very important to find the most point and to Hassan's point is like, start those conversations as early as possible. The information costs you nothing. Sure, you've got ChatGBT and you've got you know, every other resource out there, um, but it's very important to, to have the dialogue rather than try to self-research some of this stuff, or maybe even validate what you've learned on your own with these conversations with realtors, mortgage brokers, accountants, lawyers, et cetera. But it's very important to have that team behind you when you kick off this journey so you, you set yourself on the right foot. 100%, no, thank yeah. you. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, a wrap on our presentation. Uh, we'll do a Q&A, just a quick note before Q&A. Um, just to kind of add on to what Fatima Mohammed said, um, my own personal experience when I first started in real estate, this was like 10 years ago, you know, I learned the hard way. Um, and, and I had a client basically who we were listing his home. And uh, I had in my mind that the property was worth like, I think it was like 875 at the time. But he wanted to list it for like over the market value. And I was scared to tell him that, you know what, we can't list it at that price. But I'm like, what do I do, right? Like I'm new and, and what's he going to think of me? Um, and we didn't sell the property because it was overpriced. And uh, he was angry at me, rightfully so. But he was also a mentor and he, he said something that I'll never forget to this day. And he said, you know, I've hired you for one reason and one reason only. And that was to be an advisor to me, and to consult me on things. And if you thought that the property wasn't worth 925, 950, you should have told me, right? And since then, I've changed my perception. And like I said, for us, you know, it's more important to help you guys. Even if you don't buy a property today, next year, in two years, we do play a long game, but we wanna be more, you know, looked at as consultants, advisors. And many of you have called me and said, you know, how's the market? Um, what's my house worth? And you may not like what I have to say about your house because the values have gone down but I'm gonna be transparent with you and honest with you because as your realtor, I'm also your consultant and your advisor, right? I think that's what it comes down to. So, and you know, that, that's a sum it up, but um, yeah, just thank you so much for taking your time out uh, this morning. I really appreciate it. We've got a great crowd and I hope some of the points resonate with you. If there's one point you can take, ask your moms. That was the main point <laughs> but for, for advice. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, though, this, uh, this is amazing. And uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, please feel free. We're, we're here to answer. Yes. Are you excellent presentation and uh, insight. Um, so the main question I had is, you know, I have a lot of clients in the rental space. Um, do you see a leveling off of the market with regards to rental? Or do you see opportunities, especially on the condo side? Um, we've seen a lot of stability. It's not as volatile as it was. Yeah. Uh, number one. Number two is um, what what is the bottom on the mortgage side? Um, I, I'm thinking three point seven five, three point seven five, four by the end of next year. Yeah. Uh, good question. In terms of the rental markets, uh, it depends on which pocket you're in. Um, so, for example, in downtown Toronto, um, or even in Toronto in general, like Young and Eglinton or these areas. Uh, we're seeing a lot of pre-construction builds happening. And so there's a tons of inventory that's hitting the market. So the rental market isn't as competitive as it was, let's say, three years ago, four years ago. So we are seeing a little bit of a leveling off. But, you know, rent prices are still higher than what they were three years ago. So although it's, it's slower in terms of activity, um, if you look at what rents were now compared to a year ago, two years ago, we're still, like, I think 5 or 7% higher in general. Um, so there is leveling off, but overall the rental market is still very competitive. The housing market is, is extremely competitive. Uh, with condos, we're seeing more leveling off because there's a lot of inventory. 
But you know, if you have a one bedroom, one plus ten, with the amount of immigration coming into this country, students, young families, they're looking for a place. You know, and houses may be expensive for them, so their next option is to get a condo that's more affordable. Yeah, and just to finish off that point, like we see it, um, we see a, a, a very narrow view of the condo environment, um, and so you know we we do a lot of pre-construction mortgages for people who had bought a pre properties one, two, three years ago, um, and a lot of those have taken a bit of a nosedive uh, from a value perspective. When we see these appraisals come back for some of these properties, they're a hundred, hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars lower, and so. What, what, the way we look at that is like those properties have now become much more accessible than they were three years ago at that pre-construction phase. And so when you can buy a two bed, two bath at Young and Eglinton for 650, it's a bit of a bargain relative to some of the other properties that are available. And so um, that's how we see things on the, on the housing side. On the rate side, you know, if, if the, the US Fed is pricing in another two cuts and the, the ramp down is much slower than the ramp up, you know, we'll probably see quarter point decreases consecutively happening. The, the, the rise up was like half a percent increases from March onwards, right? So very, very aggressive. Uh, but if we're seeing the quarter point drop offs from, from this point on, and we, we anticipate like one or two left for the rest of the year, we'll probably end the year at four and a quarter four. Um, and we'll see 2025, you know, have a, a few follow on spread out throughout the year, but we'll probably end around like three and a quarter is my, is my guess. And at the end of next year, it's probably three and a quarter. And I think, um, a very harsh reality for a lot of people to, to have set in is like, that's the new norm. We're not going to the ones and the 2% of the world because they realize what that did to the economy. And so the likelihood that they're going to repeat their mistake, unless some version of a government comes in and says, yeah, that's the new, we should go back to that. Um, I think lesson learned and that three is probably where we're gonna stay to have an even keel balance between inflation and the, the, the economy itself. And so um, when people are thinking about factoring in their buying decisions or their refinances or renewals that are coming up, Variable versus fixed, have that at the back of your mind that three is probably where we're going to, three, three and a quarter is probably where we're going to land at the end of next year, if all things goes to plan. Um, but that's what you should be pricing in on as, as your qualification and numbers. Well, I, um, one thing we are trying to do federally is legislate so that rental income is considered towards your credit score. Do you think that this will have an effect in the short term when it comes to either new grants or for people who are personal home buyers, or something that's more of a vision for them in the long term? So yeah, so for context for everybody else, there, there's these new programs that are being introduced that allow rental income to be reported to your credit bureaus to help build up your credit profiles. Um, I think on the immigration side, uh, for a lot of people coming into the country, there are, um, there are programs that already exist from the insurance bodies. So if you're putting less than 20% down, there are insurance bodies that you may have heard of, like you know, uh, Canada Guarantee, Sajin, CMHC. These are the lar largest insurance bodies that back your mortgages when you're putting less than 20% down. It gives the, the bank a certain level of comfort that you're not going to default on your mortgage. Um, and so in those situations, they have these new to Canada programs where you may not have established credit uh, in Canada, um, but we can leverage either that, that minimal credit that you have or look at your, your home country from where you came from to look at uh, a historical credit bureau from there to be able to help you qualify. So when I look at these like rental programs, I, I see them in the light of um, sure, people who may be on the horizon to buy in the, in the future, that's a good program. It's dependent on if your landlord is reporting um, to the credit bureau. So there's a, uh, there's a little bit of a mismatch that it's not blanketed. It depends on the landlord itself. Um, number two, for people who find themselves in very difficult situations, you may have had a consumer proposal, you may have had a bankruptcy, you may have gone through a difficult turbulent time. That's a good opportunity to, to rebuild your credit as well and having them report to the credit bureau. If anybody's heard of these programs like Borrow Well or Credit Karma or Coho, they have these credit rebuilder programs where you can pay five or seven dollars a month and they will just arbitrarily report to your credit bureau that you've been paying a loan, even though that loan doesn't exist. But that's designed to help increase your, your credit profile by saying you've been consistently making payments. The rent uh, feedback to your credit bureau is the exact same concept. It's the idea that somebody is consistently reporting to your credit bureau to help increase that score. And so I don't think it hurts at all. It just really depends on your landlord if there if they're are reporting. Um, and number two, it's a, it's a unique circumstance that will, will require that, but it never hurts to have that reported to your credit bureau, as long as you're making the payments. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, great presentation. Um, it's, it's very clear you guys want to help people, which is, which is great. Um, I, I just love the angle you're coming from. Um, just a couple of specific questions on the mortgage business. Yeah. Um, you guys work across Canada. We do. And yeah. do you also work on commercial multifamily type of businesses? We're, we're, we're investing in multifamily. Got it. Uh, and across Canada pretty much. Yeah. And so, do you, do you work on CMHC as it relates to multifamily? So we do CMHC multifamily as a member of our team. It's responsible on the commercial side. We do multifamily up to four units. Um, oh, sorry, up, to up to four, four units. Up to four. 
Yeah, once it surpasses four, it falls into commercial multifamily CMHC territory. Right. Um, we don't do it ourselves, but we have a member of our team that's responsible for that. For anybody who doesn't know about the, the commercial multifamily CMHC side of things, um, for, for properties that are, are several units, um, the government has these unique programs designed to make qualification for that easier. I think the point system's changed recently on, um, you know, if the property is accessible, if it's energy efficient, there's a bunch of these different parameters that help you qualify for these properties, but they will allow you to purchase, let's say a $3 million commercial property with 5% down on a 50 year amortization. And so very different from residential properties, but um, it's very attractive for prospective investors. And I imagine that's the space that you operate in, exactly. which is very lucrative, and very complex uh, process. But if you've got somebody who's experienced, who's figured it out, it's a very good avenue for investment um, uh, that has, you know, lower barriers to capital that you could potentially pull together with others to buy those properties. And so um, very good angle, very good opportunity. Yes. Yeah. So with your experience, would you think that the real estate will go up or down if God forbid Trump will take over? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I'll let you take wow. that. <laughs> yeah. That's a really good question. <laughs> Well, last time Trump was in power, I mean, real estate was pretty good. <laughs> so, yeah, it was not bad. <laughs> but I, I don't know, like it, a lot of our markets do depend on, on the U.S., like Mohammed and Fatma mentioned earlier with, with their rate cuts and our rate cuts. So we do follow their trend. I mean, I'll give you an example. Like in 2008, this was before I was in real estate, you know, the U.S. markets no, nosedived 75%. It was a crash, right? Florida markets were down mm -hmm. and they were talking for like 50 60 grand mm -hmm. at that point we had a blip of six months where activity stalled but prices never crashed in <laughs> fact they kept going up so as much as we are tied to the u.s market i think on the real estate side i think we're a bit more independent um so i think if trump were to do something crazy like I don't know more tariffs or something where, will. which you will yeah you're right. But even even last time like he, he did a few things, but it never really impacted the market. What impacted the market was what our government was doing with our own economy. So in 2017, you know um, I think it was Kathleen Wynne, the Liberals in Ontario. You know the market was heating up in the first quarter, and she came out with these ridiculous 16 rules, which had no impact on the the real estate it was more just psychological mm -hmm. but that dropped the prices and dropped activity significantly so in hindsight it actually did work because the market cooled down um, but it was temporary my perspective i don't think it's going to impact much uh, with who's in power um, i think our real estate markets are mostly independent um, from what i've seen and what i've seen the last 12 years in the business i hope that answers the question yeah i'll just quickly add to that yeah. i think um a lot of these like events that'll happen, you know, you look at the wars, you look at the increase in inflation, you look at, you know, presidency changes in the US. These are like a, um, I see those as like a micro view. And so when you take a bit of a step back and you look at like real estate historically, the trend is always up and to the right. It's just how, you know, the, 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 the point that we mentioned earlier is like, what's your objective around real estate? If you're trying to time the market to buy something and flip it in a year, that's like as risky as putting your money into a stock for, for three weeks and, and hoping that it pops, right? I look at, I think about last week or uh, this week, actually this past week, you know, the stock market is tanked. It's like uh, blood red everywhere and <laughs> my stocks are down and the market's crashing and everybody's freaking out. And then you wait two days and everything rebounded. And so in that minute view of that one day where people thought it was like a red day, everybody went crazy and said it's recession and the market's crashing. And you see things like Nvidia still past the 3 trillion market cap. And so um, I think you, that, that same view has to apply to real estate is like, unless you're, you're, you're looking at this very narrow short term view, that's where it can be really volatile, where these presidency changes and things will matter. But if your horizon is the five to 10 plus year horizon, things will eventually normalize itself. And that 2008 crash is an example of that. Like we saw 75% wiped away, but normalized over time and eventually caught back up to where it was. Yeah. Um, but that's where the horizon when you're, when you're, when you're putting this objective together matters the most. If you see uh, there's a chart on your seats, if you look at the historic statistics and you look at from 2016 to 2020 is when I think Trump was in power. So like 2016 was actually a huge year with 113 sales, 113,000 sales. And in 2017, it went down to 92,000. But that was because of the Ontario new housing rules with Kathleen Wynne 
uh, implemented at the time. But you'll see 2018, it was a recovery year, uh, 78,000 sales. In 2019, uh, it went up 87,000. 2020, 95,000. And then I think Joe Biden came when, 2020, at the end of 2020, or, yeah. So, yeah, and then, so yeah, I don't think that has much of an impact, but we'll see. <laughs> we all know he's gonna win, I think. It's pretty clear, so. <laughs> That's what it looks like, yeah. I have uh, two questions. One is uh, regarding Niagara US site, Niagara Canvas. I did a review on TV about how Niagara the US market uh, is relatively down and uh, more affordable for yeah. people, whereas Niagara on the Canada side is very costly. So why do you see that? Is it just because of the countries, or is it more to do with something else? And yeah. second part, uh, that. How are people uh, investing on renovations to sell? Yeah, yeah. Are they doing renovations at this time to sell their properties to do that? Or what are you seeing the trends there? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, regarding Niagara US and Niagara Canada, so I, I mean, even Niagara Canada has seen a reduction in activity and, and average overall price, but what I am seeing the last three years is the Niagara region, um, St. Catharines, mm -hmm. Thorold area. You know, a lot of people who are new immigrants or people uh, I've lived in Toronto, if they weren't able to afford in the GTA, they're moving to those areas now. And that was driving up prices and activity in the Niagara Canada side. So again, I don't know much about the Niagara US side, but Niagara Canada, like it's pretty strong, right? Like people are willing to go there and obviously our country population is not as high as america you know 90 percent of our border 90 percent of our population probably lives i think at the border right and so you'll see people you know going to niagara thorold st catharines hamilton and then in a few years i think that they're going to expand even more go further you know to well into um you know there's a place called dundas which is actually an hour away from uh i think uh orangeville and so people are dry, people are moving there, and with remote working, mm -hmm. I think it's getting more and more common, right? So Niagara Canada has seen a huge boost in the last uh, when uh, during when the interest rates came down. A lot of investors mm -hmm. flock there as well. Mm -hmm. One good thing about Niagara Canada again is um, there was a lot of duplex opportunities, triplex opportunities there. A lot of people did go there for that reason, for cash flow purposes, and rent over there very very strong, right? Right now in this market, if you're going to put more renovations into your home to hope to get a higher price, you may not get the same return as you expected because the market is low. So it's not the best flipping market unless unless you get like a steal of a deal, right? Like you get like 100K below asking, 150K below asking, then you can renovate, you know? Um, and if you're a contractor or you know how to do renovation yourself, you can save on that cost and make the money. Um, but for people looking for flips, if, they, if it's priced for 650 and they're buying for 625, you know, f putting in like a 100K renovation isn't going to give you the same return based on my experience, unless you negotiate that property to a really good deal. I think what some people are doing is they're doing the bare minimum. So instead of putting in 200K, maybe 30K, 40K cosmetic upgrades, right? Mm -hmm. Painting, flooring, uh, new countertops, a very, very cheap material, but cosmetic upgrades to make it look good and uh, with great photos. So with Savannah Productions, if you ever want your, <laughs> your photos done, videos, I mean, he can make your home look like a million bucks. Um, and, uh, you know, then they can sell it. So it all depends on the marketing, the photography, whatnot. Uh, but for the flipping environment, I don't think we're there yet. If the markets come down even more, there may be opportunity. And if you find a desperate seller, it's not good for the seller, but you may be able to then achieve that goal. So cosmetics, I think, is the best way to go right now. Yeah. Uh, one thing it, I noticed that in BC, um, a lot, uh, they had to be very so that Airbnb was not allowed to be done anymore. Um, and a lot of people, when they brought their, let's say, investment property, were heavily reliant on this, uh, on this investment vehicle so that they could get their cash flow. Um, and then when they did that, it, a, lot of, a lot of people began to, if they went to Niagara Am or Ontario or something, they had to install. <coughs> in Ontario, I just want to know what your thoughts were because Obviously, it's a very touristy place. The Canadian dollar weight is right now a lot of Americans. And then major events are happening. Airport care events happen. The World Cup is coming, right? 
do you think that if they were to continue, uh, if they left it open, um, that this would keep uh, uh, pop up demand still, um, even though they're with all the free tons and stuff? Or do you think that they'll take the route of um, uh, abandoning it and then um, uh, maybe in the future like uh, reinstating it just because of where Toronto is relative to uh, global tourism? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm even, even I'm thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Kind of BC is banned, there, right? That's that's what I, yeah. I, I think the reason why BC, one of the reasons why they banned it was because they wanted to uh, flock in more inventory into the market, which was good. Um, my gut feeling is that Ontario won't do that yet, um, only because the factors you mentioned. It's th it's the most important province in Canada, uh, financially, economically, uh, with events happening here. Uh, they're probably going to need that. Um, now, I don't know too much about the Airbnb process, to be honest with you, um, but I think you know there are people making good money on that. If they were to ban it, I don't know. I think you'll have more inventory in the market, but uh, I think a lot of landlords will probably rebel as well because um, it's a good way to make make income, right? Maybe well, you can. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you our like personal experience. I I attended Instagram University, and so you see like all these people doing like. Uh, uh, was it rental arbitrage and yeah. uh, Airbnb arbitrage, et cetera. And so I actually spent some time looking into it. We, I think we had a brief chat about it too. Um, but the idea is that, uh, so there isn't like an outright ban in Ontario for Airbnbs. And I think when you, when you think to like major events like the, uh, the World Cup coming to Canada, you know, for, for whatever portion of it it's gonna be, um, there's gonna be like a, a really peak demand for that really focused moment in time, um, which I think people will look to. When, when you think about Airbnb and you look at these buildings, um, while there isn't a ban in Ontario, there is bans in the buildings themselves. Um, and so when you look at Airbnb arbitrage, it's actually restricted to like two or three buildings in downtown Toronto that allow it. The rest of them have outright banned it. Now there are people who will circumvent those rules and uh, in the Airbnb description it says, when you come there, don't tell them you're an Airbnb guest. Tell them, I'm just going to meet my friend. It's very like, uh, um, suspicious. work around, yeah, very suspicious mm -hmm. work around way to get to, to have people uh, get to your Airbnb. So I think I don't, I, I agree with Hassan. I don't know that we'll necessarily get to a point where it's, it's going to be outright banned by the province, but the condos themselves are already doing a good job at banning it themselves. And so whoever's willing to take a risk to uh, run arbitrage or run Airbnb out of a, out of a building that's banned, those are, are going to be the risk takers, and that'll be a subset of it. But I think um, in general, you're, you know, uh, yeah, I, it's a Blanket answer is I don't think it'll be banned. There's just going to be, to fulfill that demand, there's going to be the risk takers who make their properties available for people to attend. And it's a matter of time before the other condo owners in that building. That, like, that's the primary use case why people don't like Airbnbs in their condos. Is I live here, I've got, let's say, party animals next door to me, and that's not the environment that I signed up for. And so it's the constant breaking of these rules in these condos that have led them to instill their own bans on the buildings themselves. Yes. I remember a question. Yeah. Um, what are your recommendations with respect to cash flow? So, for example, if you have a situation where banks approve it, they pass a the stress test, but they're still short by about $100 to $200 a month, um, and now with a decreasing mortgage environment, would you recommend to your to your clients to go ahead with that and you know beat that loss in the short term? But there's you know a lot of growth in the long term. Yeah. No, it's a it's a good question. I think it depends on, on the market so or that pocket. So if it's a pocket where you know you can bet on future appreciation, you can hedge that you know, going forward, like there will be appreciation here. I'm totally okay with it. I know a lot of gurus out there will tell you that, oh, you know, negative cash flow is a bad thing. And it is a bad thing if you're like 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks in negative cash flow. But if you're in a pretty safe interest rate and it's 100 bucks, maybe 200 bucks, you know, I think the easiest answer, you know, we're spending 200 bucks eating out anyways. <laughs> Just cut that 200 bucks and put it into your property. You'll probably get more appreciation that way. That's what I've been taught. Uh, so I think it's fine. Um, and if you see overall, like when we do a uh, pro forma for my investors, I tell them the rate on investment, not just on, you know, the appreciation. It's also on the principal recapture, right? And if you have cash flow, you add cash flow as well. But principal recapture and then appreciation as well, even at 2.5%. But principal recapture is a huge um, return on investment, right? Because someone else is paying down most of your mortgage and your interest. So you're 100 bucks, 200 bucks below asking, you can foot the bill. 
And then I think over time, you can raise the rents as well. Rents will go up and your expenses will also go up. But at some point, you know, you got to eat that. And then if you're going to be looking for a quick sale, maybe four or five years down the road, it might make sense. Um, but yeah, I would just say save somewhere else and put that into your condo. But I think for me, that breaking point is no more than 250. Me personally, I know others are okay with 500 bucks. Me is like 250, I get a bit uncomfortable, you know? Yeah, you yeah I, no, I just think like that was our, our, our primary use case for making the investment when we bought a property in Kingston, right? I think we're, you know, at the very onset of it, this is like five and a half percent interest rates. Um, you know, after your maintenance, after your property management, after your property taxes <laughs> and the mortgage, let's say you're underwater 100, 200 bucks. That's the equivalent of Hassan's advice of putting like 50 to 100 bucks away in a Wealth Simple account or an Edward Jones or whatever it might be. And so if I'm investing that into the property, even at five and a half percent, you know, the, the, let's say the monthly mortgage payment is is a thousand dollars. You know, at the very onset of that mortgage, maybe 800 bucks of that is going towards interest. But I'm still getting that $200 in principal recapture. And that's a that's a, a big piece of that puzzle that people often overlook. Is that principal recapture that's happening that Isan mentioned? Somebody is paying off that mortgage. They're accumulating that principal for you. And so while you're investing $100 to $200, you're investing in that recapture, but also the appreciation. And so um, I, I can't stress this enough. It really depends on your objective. If your objective is I'm going to hold this for five to 10 years, just like the chart shows, you're going to see this up into the right trend. And that's going to happen on appreciation. That's going to happen on over time as interest rates come down, as more of your payment skews towards principal than it does interest, you're going to start recapturing more. It's a snowball effect, right? And so while it may be $200 in recapture today, it may be you know $700 a month in recapture three years from now. And that snowball will, will pay dividends in the future. It's just um, a lot of people, and, and again, this is Instagram university. It's like instant gratification. It's like make a quick buck and I, I could sell e-com stuff and make a hundred thousand dollars a month. That, that reality does, you, you know, somebody sees a person. So you went to the same university as me. And so, um, but in that world, I think this is where having the plan, having the right people in your corner and setting yourself up for success, even on the accounting side, it's important, right? To think about what do those deductions look like? How do I write off these expenses? Can I use it to my advantage? Um, having that structure set up in the right way will pay dividends in the future. You just, you can't think about making that quick buck. And that, that 100 to $200 investment is gonna pay yeah, I think on the tax side, like when you report the loss, you can recover some of those taxes. Exactly. And reduce your cash flow loss. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's why it's a, I, I feel like uh, it's very surface level to look at it as a $100 a month loss or negative cash flow when there's these other ancillary benefits that you could take advantage of that just wipe that, that negative cash flow away. So very important to have that team behind you. Yes, uh, mom. Two questions. Yeah. Um, in regards to cash flow, you know, being able to like generate enough wealth to be able to even buy one of these properties, does garden suites versus basement rentals are is there is there um, can you make more from a garden suite versus you know basement rental? Is there any like info on that? Garden suites, I think, will probably fetch you a bit more rent because you're obviously above ground, right? But it also it's cost quite a bit of money to build that garden suite, right? I mean, Amazon has forty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you go Amazon route. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. But if you go the city of Toronto route, then you know you have to see what their uh, descriptions are. I think a lot of I don't know how it works in the mortgage side, but yeah. you know, for for garden suites, I think when you make additions. Doesn't it increase your property taxes? And how does it impact? Like, can you get a mortgage on on that, or does it imp implicate? Yeah. That? So, uh, unless so, you wouldn't get a mortgage on the garden suite itself. No. Um, it'd be a cost that you'd have to outlay. And so, whether you refinance your property to pay for it, whether you get a HELOC, a loan, whatever the case might be, on the on the the rental income side, when we look at qualification, the bank doesn't care whether it's a basement, whether it's a garden suite. They they want to know their guidelines are that it's a self-contained suite that has a kitchen, has a bedroom, has a bathroom, and has a separate entrance. If you, if you check off those four parameters, they will allow you to consider market rent for that property, whether it be the basement or the garden suite. I think you're gonna find a harder challenge in finding comparables for garden suites because it's such a new concept. Because the city of Toronto now allows people to build it, you've gotta build up that inventory of rental income or market data to be able to inform what that rental is. So their next best comparable is gonna be the basement suite. And so if I look at it right now, it's probably gonna be apples to apples until we have enough market data, especially when you look at the suburbs. Like not a lot of people are building garden suites in Richmond Hill right now. Yeah. But when that inventory builds up over time, you'll have something comparable. But I, I, my best guess would be they're gonna benchmark against basement suites for now.
So you won't see a material difference. The, the other question was in regards to, um, you talked about SM Highway, you know, you, both of you talked about like you're, rent, you're renting in Kingston, right? And you talked about the indicators to like being able to rent outside of Toronto or, right. like, to these places and like just looking for like more gentrified areas. Yep. What are some resources, you know, like I or anyone can use to see this development happening in these outside areas to go and, you know, pursue investing in those areas? Yeah, I'll quickly say something because he's the expert on this. I, if I were to do the research myself, I'd go in a rabbit hole and second guess myself on every data point that I would look at. And so when you ask what the resource is, like this is my resource. <laughs> I, I had put like, my yeah, <laughs> so I put us on to work in, in saying, look, we've got capital deploy, find us the best opportunity and where to deploy it. And I think all the data points that he mentioned that he came back to, it like made complete sense. And I see it in, in, in reality now in the, the quality of the tenants that are coming through um, like the the rental demand for that area, like I think we had, we had, we our tenant had moved out and we just got a new tenant like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Rental demand was through the roof, and the types of people that were coming through were amazing. And so, uh, I'll let him speak to like the parameters and how he goes about his research or what resources he used. But that, yeah. that's my research. No, it's a, it's a very good question. I mean, <clears throat> I think for me, what I've done now since I've started exploring other cities is I have actually taken the time out to go out and drive to these places. I've even spent a few days there, maybe a week or two, take the family too, just make it a road trip, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I've done that, you know? Me and uh, Ali, uh, my brother-in-law, we actually went the very first time and uh, we went to Kingston, we drove and, and we just came across a sales center and this was like four years ago and uh, the lady over there was a realtor and so she was my resource. And so she told me the whole plan for what's happening in Kingston, you know, what the inventory levels are, what the appreciation is year over year, what the rental market is like, you know, uh, what types of people are renting, what's coming up for employment, what kind of jobs are in this uh, city. And obviously she gave me the information, then I had to go and verify that, right? Because I want to see for myself. And so I did my own research, I verified it. Then we bought our own property, started with that. And I saw those things, you know, happen in real, uh, you know, in real time. And so for me, the biggest thing was just driving down there, spending a few days there. Now, for you to do that, obviously, you know, you can do that if you want. You don't have to. Like he said, I can be that resource for you. Um, but I've got data points of like the last five or 10 years appreciation year over year, uh, what the rental markets look like year over year, what's causing rents to go up, you know, what are the indicators, you know, what's happening now, like they're thinking of building. Uh, they've built a bridge in Kingston, by the way, which is connecting the east and the west even faster, right? Uh, they have built the Amazon warehouse there, which is massive. Uh, they're building a, a new senior complex there, uh, very close to uh, our investment, you know? And so this stuff brings employment, right? People are like, employment is a big factor. So I look at employment charts, employment um, jobs, what's happening there. It's very boring stuff, but I like it, you know, so I enjoy that because it helps me sort of validate that this information is accurate. And that way I can go to my clients, my friends and say, this is what I see personally. These are the numbers. And this is what's happening with job growth. Like job growth is such a huge indicator. And then um, they're talking about this. I, I mean, long, like, like 10, 20 years, they're even talking about building a train station from Kingston to like Toronto, which will get you to Toronto for like maybe within like an hour and a half or an hour. So who knows, right? I mean, these are long-term things, but you know, those are things that I'm interested in. So I look at all those data points and uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question, but that's kind of what we look at. You I know? went to Instagram University. So <laughs> <laughs> you see a Starbucks being developed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Actually, uh, if there's a Costco in the city, that's a huge indicator. <laughs> yeah, because Costco has done its research, right? They know where mm -hmm. people are moving, they know where people are living. Costco, Walmart, they've done their research. So that's, for me, I'm like, oh, Costco is here. There must be a reason why they came here. And that's real, actually. Then I kind of validate that and look at my own data points. And we have, like, I may have information that you may not be privy to because we have our systems. So I can go online on my system and check, you know, what were the last rental rates in the last 12 months? You know, when I did a comparison for him, I did, I said, okay, this is what the last six homes sold for in the last six months. This is what we should offer or price it out at. This is what the rental market, this is how many homes rented out, and this is what they were getting, you know? So those data points, which are actually available on House Sigma, by the way, for you as well, but you may not be able to find that because it's hard to navigate, but I can find that information.
Um, one thing I wanted to ask was that, um, you know, there's, we talk about topics like livability, and for example, uh, in regards to uh, population density, and um, for example, where you're renting and buying. Um, this is my understanding and research, like uh, Toronto was one of those places where people came to buy homes, then they, want, they got condos because they wanted to get close to the city and stuff. And then people generally, like, uh, as immigrants would rent first, then obviously buy it, and most of us, our families have done so. One thing I wanted to ask was that, this is, uh, with like, urban planning, housing development, and legislation, is the government at this point like is it um, is it important for them to realize that any home buyer is factoring the idea of and it's like a uh, it's like a standard thing now that they they should create um, housing or legislative so that there would be rents or for example there would be a secondary uh, home portion that uh, that they would want and then look to put the capital on. I, there's still a lot of red tape right now uh, in Ontario, um, which is why inventory is still very low and there's so much bureaucracy with the governments and you know to build but uh, you know the, the last I think last six months uh, Ford government whether you like him or hate him um, did come out with some uh, avenues where the speed of building homes will become quicker and then Trudeau again whether you like him or hate him uh, did come out with a program for yeah, and also for, for builders to, uh, in, incentives to build rental apartments, rental buildings, and maybe, also Ben, maybe you can, I don't know, I'm not sure if you have knowledge about that, but so it's kind of going to speed up that process, but, you know, the, unfortunately the fact remains is the system is still broken, and I don't think we're ever going to come to a point where we're going to have enough inventory for uh, people to buy a home, and that's why you're seeing these massive spikes in prices. I think one of the big reasons is because you know, even in Markham and Richmond Hill, like it's so hard to get a permit to build a legal basement. Like it's so difficult. So people are just illegally, you know, renting out the basement. We need the income, right? Know. So if there's a way that the government could address those issues to like help, you know, average homeowners to make income, but also create inventory for people that need to rent, like they're bringing in a million people, like last year they brought in 458,000 immigrants to the country. It wasn't 458, it was actually a million people, right? They missed out on the students, uh, work visas, those people, right? 450,000, yes, PRs, but you also have students. Like where are they going to live, right? Bringing in more people, but not building enough houses. So I don't know if they want to keep the system broken, unfortunately, maybe that's the objective. But if they were to make sort of a situation where, you know, homeowners could make a secondary suite in their basements or in their homes, that would help a lot. I think like Mohammed Chamdi said that um, the garden suites was a big thing, but not everyone's building it because it's so costly at times, right? And there's so much, like you can only do so much because you have to have a certain size backyard and whatever. And so it looks like the government's doing stuff, but they're not doing enough, right? So unfortunately, I think more has to be done. Um, yeah, sorry for the long answer, but I think we need to balance it out, right? If we're going to call on that many people, then we have to also figure out ways where we can make things easier to, you know, build a basement. Like to build a basement, you got to pay twenty thousand dollars for a separate entrance, right? You got to have an exhaust. You got to have two uh, fire exits. Like this stuff costs a lot of money, and so people are like, why am I going to pay this much to make a basement? So like, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, is that something to factor in regards to um, future development of homes? So I recently I went to um, Alberta yeah. and I was talking with the West Edmonton Mall and I saw the huge housing complex and developments that are happening. And obviously it's like uh, what they say, obviously you see that the Texas and Canada, they're all people moving and stuff. Yeah. So is that something to factor in when it comes to, okay, I'm buying this home now, um, relative I can rent it and stuff, but how hard is it, or for example, how much like, uh, capital is it going to require or just like human capital by effort? to be able to develop this home, to be able to rent it out, or be able to furnish, for example, the kitchen and stuff. And that's something to also factor as well, too. Yeah, you definitely factor that in, too. Like, you know, what are the future costs, future pro prospects of it? Um, I know some builders have actually done a good job now where they're actually already building a separate entrance for you. Um, I've seen it at Stouffville, Mark, and Richmond Hill. So that helps, but even that separate entrance, they've built it, but you still have to get a legal permit to build the rest of the basement, right? Um, but yeah, you look at that stuff and see how easy it is. Map out what your costs are going to be. Uh, map out your uh, construction process. Talk to like like Komel, who's a who's a contractor, renovator. Uh, you know, use him as a resource, 
and, and map it out so that you you don't hit with surprise and you see okay it's going to cost you 100k you know before you do it so buy the house i mean before you buy the house map out your cost ahead of time and what you need to do and how you can do it um and then go forward with with the game plan yeah, no, I, I don't trust the government. Uh, <laughs> okay. Everything that's come out is a half measure. Yeah. Like extending amortization to 30 years on new construction for first time home buyers changes yeah. your qualification by like 10, 20 grand. It's, yeah. it's not material. Yeah. And so I, I think he, he's got the right idea. It's like, I, I always say this, and I, I can't stress this enough, the objective, right? Whenever you're buying this property, is it a long-term hold? If you invest the capital to build something, will you either get the return or will you see enough appreciation? These are all factors you want to talk through with your team to make sure that you're making the right decision before you decide outlaying capital. But yeah, my, I just don't trust the government. That's my yeah. biggest takeaway. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you again for coming out. Um, just uh, one last point for you guys. Uh, we did want to mention that we'll be sending out a survey to you guys individually. Uh, if you don't mind sending us a reply or filling out the survey. You know, a lot of our community is asking about, you know, where the market's headed, what's happening with interest rates. I know we talked about it today, but we're sort of doing a complimentary 20 minute Zoom call uh, with our community, with each client, with each person. And we're basically doing what's called a real estate action plan. That's a fancy word for it, but mm -hmm. it's more of like a financial checkup from the neck up where we can do an evaluation for your home. Um, we can introduce you to investment opportunities. Maybe you wouldn't know that there's an opportunity that you could actually purchase an investment property. Um, so that's kind of what we want to introduce you to. So if you're open to that 20 minute Zoom call, it'll be in the survey, you can just click yes. You can let us know and we can set up a, a call later on. And if you have any questions, real estate, mortgage related, by all means, give us a call. We're always happy to help you guys. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you.